An increase in COVID-19 cases as we enter into the flu season. The person that you don't know uh, who's one link away in a transmission chain. How to prepare for the questions surrounding vaccines. When requirements do occur, they almost always happen at the state level or the employer level. A spike in the number of families opting for in-home schooling. We didn't have the technology and things just readily available. And so we made the decision to actually pull our kids out of uh, Gridley, out of Tucson Unified School District. Hello and welcome to Arizona 360. I'm Lorraine Rivera. Thanks so much for joining us. The second wave of COVID-19 is surging in Arizona. To date, since the pandemic began earlier this year, the state has recorded more than 280,000 confirmed cases and nearly 6,400 deaths. The new daily average of infections is 3,000. Professor Michael Warby is an epidemiologist at the University of Arizona and says the seasonal flu coupled with the holidays may worsen the situation. Arizona is on track, uh, like so many other states in the U.S. right now, uh, to, to get back into crisis mode with this virus uh, if we don't change our behaviors uh, and and we, we have, you know, a, a few difficult months to get through uh, before the payoff from this really great news that we've heard with, uh, with vaccines, uh, but these are going to be tricky months. It seems every week we're learning something new about how this virus spreads. What is most striking to you, I mean, given that you've studied flu patterns in the past? Uh, one one of the things uh, that is coming out uh, is is just how variable the the transmission patterns are. So, you know the the magic number to get uh, below is you want less than one transmission per person infected. You know if you if you have if if each person who's infected is transmitting the virus to two people then the epidemic is going to grow exponentially. It's going to explode. If you get it down to below one person, uh, then it's going to sort of tail off. But even if you're at that sort of point of, of approximately, you know, the average person is infecting one other person, if you look at the actual people who are infected, 10 of if you look at 10 people nine of them probably aren't infecting anyone at all and that 10th person is going to a bar and infecting 10 10 people and and that that's what we we need to really curtail that that it, when you, when you're careful with these measures like mask wearing and and not uh going into crowded spaces and 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 trying to keep that bubble uh, so you're not congregating with a lot of people outside of your your own very small set of family and friends um, th that that's what we need to do to to get through this dangerous time the holidays are upon us many of us can't resist we want to spend time with family and friends to celebrate traditions what is your guidance for how the best way to behave here over the next couple of months is uh, I would say um, look forward to next year because next year, the, 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 the two vaccines that have, have been, uh, where the results have been announced, uh, the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine, they're both 95% effective. Uh, and that means we really are going to be able to get back to normal, uh, but not until probably you know, April or May of next year. And so, you know, if at all possible, just modify things this year. Don't have a big gathering where you bring people uh, uh, from multiple households under one roof. Just don't do it this year. Uh, don't do it for your own sake, uh, but try to think of it from that perspective of the person that you don't know uh, who's one link away in a transmission chain, maybe in an old folks home, uh, maybe someone who uh, has a, an underlying health condition, people who are developmentally disabled are at very high risk for, for this virus. So think about those people uh, and maybe just modify things uh, for, for this Thanksgiving and Christmas season. In your opinion, what do you think needs to happen right now to stop this or to end it? 
we need to mitigate. Uh, we can't stop it. We need to mitigate. Uh, and each one of us is, is a tiny little part uh, of that mitigation. Uh, and if we all do what we can, um, it'll make a huge difference. Okay. Dr. Michael Warby, thank you for your insight. Thank you very much. As the possibility of a vaccine for the coronavirus draws near, questions mount. States and counties usually take the lead, but for this aspect of the public health emergency, the federal government is guiding states. This week, we're hearing from Kieran Goff. She's a University of Arizona law professor who has an appointment in the Applied Health Policy Institute at the U of A College of Public Health. The federal government does have a playbook for local jurisdictions to prepare for but the vaccination to roll out. It's a 75 page document and actually nowhere in that document do they mention vaccine requirements. They do have a section where they focus very heavily on communication and targeting messaging to specific populations. So my impression is that, that the CDC is very much encouraging voluntary programs and communication strategies rather than requirements. Now, the, when, the, when requirements do occur, they almost always happen at the state level or the employer level. And there is quite a bit of precedent specifically for schools and uh, healthcare settings to have requirements either by a healthcare employer themselves or a state that requires it of healthcare settings. But it's not clear yet what states will do with regard to this vaccine. Vaccines can be controversial. So let's say the state of Arizona passes a requirement for the COVID-19 vaccine. It then trickles down into local municipalities. If a first responder frontline worker says, I'm not comfortable, the research is not out as is to the extent that I would like to see, that person can decline, but their job could then be in jeopardy. Is that correct? According to the precedent that we've seen in other settings with other vaccines, that, that's correct. That uh, if a person doesn't have a disability or a specific medical condition that would warrant exemption, they could decline, but then correct, their job could be in jeopardy. Yet to be seen how that might be applied to COVID-19 specifically, because the safety situation is different for this vaccine. Most likely it would be approved through an emergency use authorization by the Food and Drug Administration. And that would mean that we haven't studied it as much for safety. So for that reason, my guess would be that, that states might be more hesitant to pass those types of laws because the, the safety information is not as clear, but uh, it's yet to be seen, at least from, from the legal reading that I've done, whether or not the legal precedent might be a little bit different because of less safety information here. Could the same ramifications apply to schools? Because as we know, children are often required to be vaccinated. How easily could the state now say, your child has to be vaccinated against COVID-19? So schools are a bit trickier. The, there's, there's a ton of legal precedent with regard to states requiring both public and private schools to have for children to be vaccinated as a condition of attending school. And that is constitutional with some exceptions in some states. But again, the situation with COVID-19 is a little bit unique. And I would say that it's unlikely for there to be school-based requirements anytime soon during this pandemic. And that's because this vaccine has not been tested in school-aged children. You probably foresee lawsuits coming as a result of this. Is that fair to say? I think that would be likely, especially since some of this would be unsettled with you know, the current case law of, of vaccines. Okay, so where does this leave us? What's, what are do we expect here in the coming months as the possibility of a vaccine becomes more real for many people? I think it's most likely that first jurisdictions will rely on communication strategies and encourage voluntary use of vaccines. I think that we'll see some variance from state to state, 
and that, that some states will be quicker to try and require vaccines and same thing with some employers, but that, that because we're in such a polarized and politicized environment, it is likely that there will be lawsuits if to those requirements. And I, I also think that, that we'll see the, the inverse occur which would be that, that we will have limited doses of these vaccines initially. And so you'll see people who would like to get vaccinated who don't have access yet because of a limited supply. And those people might want to pursue lawsuits as well. So it'll be really interesting to see really how many people would like to decline the vaccine and, and whether that's uh, a higher or a lower percentage of people than might be predicted. All right, Professor Kieran Goff, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. The pandemic continues to challenge education, especially in the K-12 setting. In Pima County, the number of families opting to homeschool students has grown by more than 1,000 compared to this time last year. Tony Panagua picks up the story from here. Out of the three classes, probably 90% of you put 80. Public classrooms with children have been part of the American landscape for generations, but 2020 has morphed into a whole new scenario. Due to concerns about COVID-19, Tucson Unified School District and many others have curtailed or temporarily suspended in-person learning. For teachers like Amy Bunch, it's been technologically and emotionally draining. Instead of seeing her students in person at Gale Elementary School on Tucson's east side, she is doing the best she can online. So this is my 20th year, and it is unlike any year I have taught yet. Yes, this is, uh, as a teacher, <laughs> we have really had to recreate the wheel. I mean, we're constantly thinking of how we can reach kids because this is such a different model. It's, you know, than anything that we've ever been used to. In addition to being a teacher for a couple of decades, Amy Bunch is also a busy parent with 11-year-old triplets. This fall would have been their first year at Gridley Middle School, something they had really wanted for a long time. But Amy and her husband had to make a difficult decision. The conclusion that I kept coming back to was that while I love Gridley and I'm sure that they're doing a phenomenal job, it, it's such a new format for all of us. We're not, we're not set up to teach remotely. Um, we're not, you know, we didn't have the technology and things just readily available. And so we made the decision to actually pull our kids out of uh, Gridley, out of Tucson Unified School District for hopefully what's just this year. <laughs> um, and we enrolled them in Arizona Virtual Academy, which is, that's what they do. They are designed to teach kids virtually. So it's a homeschool program. Um, and, you know, it's, it's going really well. Pima County Superintendent of Schools says homeschooling is gaining popularity for many parents and their children. Hundreds more have joined that model compared to 2019 and previous school years. Typical year, we'll probably have somewhere around 2,800 to 3,000 homeschoolers. Right now, we have about 4,600 families that have enrolled in the homeschool education program here. Um, by law, if you're the ages of 6 to 16, you must be enrolled in something, whether it's a district school, charter school, private school, or home school. And so our office just wants to be that olive branch of help. And so we have families that are saying, the remote's really hard for me because it's hard for me to be a teacher and do everything that the school's doing. Or they're saying, I'm just too afraid right now with the pandemic. I'm going to keep my kids home and I want to do it on our own. And so we just want to make sure that families have a right to anything that they want to do. Uh, it's an open enrollment state. And this is a time to communicate heavily. And then if you need something, it's a time for you to contact our office and we'll point you in the right direction. And while homeschooling appears to be working for many families, each time a student drops out, the districts pay a price. Well, the, the biggest impact is financial. Uh, Gabriel Trujillo has been the leader of Tucson Unified School District since 2017. The district receives uh, pretty close to $5,000 per student in state aid provided by um, the state of Arizona. And when we lose students, we lose funding. And if we lose funding, we lose what we need for books, buildings, and buses, and everything that we need for service to students, teacher salaries, equipment for extracurricular activities and sports, music instruments. All of that comes from the state aid 
and the state funding that we receive per student. Since the pandemic began earlier this year, districts in Southern Arizona have recorded a drop in their attendance. To USD as a whole, we've experienced a loss of 2,600 students um, per our 40th day of the school year. And that's about a 4.9% drop in enrollment. That could be for various reasons, like homeschooling, charter schools, moving to another community, or not having the internet connection and technological devices to attend classes online. The district is trying to help by providing brick and mortar destinations to more than 1,300 students who qualify. These include kids with learning disabilities, foster students, refugees, English language learners, and students that are homeless. The lessons, however, are still online. These are our groups that we're really, really trying to prioritize for service, though any family in TUSD that's really in need of just having uh, a place for their kid to go during the day, we do make space for them. Educators say as long as it is safe and practical, the best option would be to return to traditional learning models in the classroom. At TUSD, this could be as early as January if all goes well, but this pandemic remains unpredictable for everyone. What I want the parents to know is that their feelings are 100% real. We share those feelings as parents here at this office, and we want to help point you in a direction that's going to help. And I'm sure you, like billions of people around the world, want to put this chapter behind us. Oh my goodness, I just want to be back in my classroom. <laughs> For sure, yeah, it's been so different. But you know what, it's been, um, it's been a learning experience and it's something that I will for sure remember just as a teacher and a mom for my lifetime. And, uh, you know, I think we'll come out better for it. I'd like to think that. In the Sunnyside Unified School District, the second largest in Southern Arizona, leaders have seen about an 8% enrollment decrease. To better understand how the pandemic is presenting challenges to students when it comes to their academics as well as social development, we got insight from Pam Betton, the Chief Academic Officer of Curriculum and Instruction. Let's talk about academics. I mean, how are children able to make up some of what's been lost? The big question right now is how do we determine what is what are those learning gaps? One of the, the big challenges that's presenting is how do you identify what learning is occurring um, and how do we have evidence of that learning? So where we know that the pacing and the um, general assignments or tests that you would normally be doing in a semester are different. And so it's the challenge becomes how do we identify what those learning gaps are without making assumptions that there are huge learning gaps? Because we do know kids are learning. It looks different. It feels different. So we need to figure out how do we how do we better figure out what is that learning that's occurring? And then how can we adjust for those learning gaps? We often hear that children are resilient. What is your assessment as to how easy it's going to be to get, back ki to get kids back to where they need to be when it comes to academics? We just had a conversation last week actually with students, with some of our middle school and high school students, asking them, you know, why do they choose to engage and why do they not engage and what do they wish their teachers knew? Because I think that student voice is critical here as we make decisions moving forward. The lessons that we are learning do matter. We can adjust and be better for students moving out of this space. We have to figure out what are the gaps that we need to fill and what are the gaps that if we just make some adjustments down the road, it's not about going backward, it's about going forward. So how do we identify what those are and then make the adult instructional moves to fill those gaps or to be aware that they may occur and provide that for students moving forward. One of the things that the students um, overwhelmingly indicated to us was they miss the contact. They miss learning as a social construct and they miss that. They miss their teachers. So as we move, we've been in hybrid and remote as we move back to remote for a little while. It's really thinking about how do we create opportunities for students to engage, be partners in the learning, not just receiving direct instruction and messaging from teachers to students. And that is critical for students to move their learning forward and for us to engage students for the long term. Many people think that children are falling behind and that's probably inevitable, but they must be gaining something from all this as well, correct? 
They absolutely are. And I am, I check myself all the time to really question what are my assumptions and what do I really know in this space? Um, because it's so different from anything we've ever experienced in education. It's hard to believe there aren't going to be huge gaps, but I'm not sure of that. I, I am surprised on a daily basis when I go into visit virtual classrooms or I'm able to see hybrid learning take place. And I, su I am surprised so many times at how far students have moved the learning and how, how they have taken opportunities to really learn in a different way. So I think there's a growth in student agency and an opportunity to really build that muscle in them to, to persevere and to figure out, to be resourceful, to figure out how can I learn and how else can I learn. That'll be very powerful coming back into the classroom as long as we make the adjustments in the classroom so that that doesn't become status quo as it once was either. So I think there's learning on both ends as a system. There's a lot for educators for us to learn um, at all levels of how to not waste what we're learning during these critical times, these just crucial learning times, and to capitalize on them because our students are very resilient. They're very resourceful. And I think we just need to provide what are those opportunities and occasions for them to showcase and grow that. All right, one of those life lessons we often hear about. All right, Pam Betton from Sunnyside Unified School District, thank you. Thank you. Earlier this month, the state received a 500-page report detailing how it, victim advocates, and law enforcement agencies across different jurisdictions can work more effectively when it comes to investigating missing and murdered Indigenous women cases. In Arizona, there are 22 federally recognized tribes, and the FBI works alongside law enforcement in tribal reservations to help solve certain crimes. We got insight from Steve Patterson. He's the assistant special agent in charge of Tucson. The FBI has federal jurisdiction on the Indian reservations on all uh, felonies uh, and, and greater crimes. So uh, the FBI works hand in hand in tandem with uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs and the tribal police. Every relationship with each tribe and their police department is a little bit different but we work in connection with the local department, the local tribal department on all violent crimes to include homicides, uh, violent assaults, and crimes against children. We are involved in those investigations from the beginning. Uh, we sometimes work with the tribe on the evidence collection. Sometimes we bring in our, our evidence collection team. Uh, it just really kind of depends on, on what the situation is, but we are involved and work, have a true partnership with uh, the tribes. Why in, in the Grand Lake scheme of the government systems does the FBI have a role in those particularly violent crimes? It's, a, it's an act uh, law that was passed years ago that um, all violent crimes, all felonies fall under the juris jurisdiction of the FBI. It's um, it's a process that's been going on for years, and we work in tandem. Uh, we've actually set up a Safe Trails Task Force. How has that Safe Trails program evolved over the years? Because it started in the 90s, I think? Right. It started in 19, actually 1994 in Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, with the Navajo Nation. And uh, it's evolved. It now is throughout the nation. Um, we have a Safe Trails Task Force here. The participants are obviously us and uh, Pasquayaki Police Department and Tohono O'odham Police Department. Some of these investigations can be complex because of the suspect or the victim's ethnicity. Can you explain when it becomes uh, different? Generally speaking, when a, um, a Native American um, is involved in the crime and it's a felony, then the FBI is involved. Um, a situation that comes up relatively often in which we don't have federal jurisdiction is at the Indian casinos. Um, if two non-Native Americans were to get into a fight and somebody were to get hurt and it'd be, it's, it's an assault, um, 
those are crimes that the FBI, because you have two non-Native Americans, we don't have federal jurisdiction. It's just kind of one of the nuances. Because tribal police are dual certified through the state and federal government, the FBI is investigating the murder of Brian Brown, a 19-year veteran of the Tana Otham Police Department. The suspect will be tried in the federal court system. Tribes have their own court systems as well, but at what point does it get kicked back to the federal system? The tribal courts can um, prosecute misdemeanors. That's where, so I believe the misdemeanor level is, is at one year. So any, any tribal issues that are misdemeanors, the tribal court handles. Um, however, the, the tribal police departments have federal jurisdiction. So if there was a, an investigation that maybe we don't, we won't, based off of the, the, the crime level, we maybe don't investigate, the, those police departments can go and present the case to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Under numerous presidential administrations, it seems that tribes have been given more autonomy when it comes to cases like you're referring to. Um, how would you like to see or how have those, those systems sort of evolved over the years and where are they headed next? It's very easy for us to work together and to figure out um, what ultimately is the best prosecutive method. The police departments within these, uh, within Pascoyak and Tohono O'odham are only getting better and better and better. And we work with them hand in hand. Moving forward, I would just like to see that relationship just continue, continue to grow. Um, and this is where we can really, one of the benefits are working together is to work because of the dynamic of where Tohono O'odham is and Pasquayaki is to the city of Tucson is help facilitate some of those conversations when we have crimes that are being committed on both sides of, you know, maybe the city of Tucson and on the reservation is to work with both departments to try to ensure that we, we you know, keep everybody safe. Before we end this week's show, we need to correct an error from last week's program. At the time of our recording, before the votes were certified, we said that Pima County Treasurer Beth Ford lost her bid for re-election. That was incorrect, and we regret the error. Arizona 360 will not broadcast next week due to the Thanksgiving holiday. We'll return the first week of December. In the meantime, you can visit us on social media or send an email to Arizona360 at azpm.org. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.